good to go? Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, let's go ahead and get started with today's uh, presentation. So uh, we're very pleased today to have Dr. Robert Phillips. He is the uh, Executive Vice President and uh, Chief Physician Executive at Houston Methodist Hospital. He's also the President and CEO of the Houston Methodist uh, Physician Organization, and he's a Professor of Medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College. Uh, Dr. Phillips uh, went to medical school in New York at the Icon School of Medicine uh, of Mount Sinai uh, Hospital, where he received the award for highest standing in his class. Um, he also uh, received a uh, PhD uh, as well as his MD in molecular biology, and uh, then went on to do a residency in internal medicine at uh, New York Presbyterian, followed by a fellowship in cardiology and hypertension at uh, Mount Sinai. So Dr. Phillips, uh, I think as all of us know, is really a uh, internationally renowned uh, cardiologist and hypertension expert, and he's been involved in over 60 uh, clinical trials uh, as either PI or co-PI in this field. And uh, he's, I think, unique in that he's had 20 years of consecutive NIH funding uh, uh, for his uh, research endeavors. Very extensively published, 170 peer-reviewed uh, publications, uh, as well as a recent book that he published uh, a couple years ago on America's healthcare transformation, strategies, and, and innovation. And so I think we're very pleased to have Dr. Phillips here today to give us an update on the current blood pressure guidelines. Rob, take it away. Steve I really appreciate it. Uh, really a pleasure to be here. And for you, all you who are watching online, I'm glad and um, very appreciative that you are with us as well. So I'm going to talk about the blood pressure guidelines today, but I'm also going to put it um, in the context of um, how we behave as physicians and how we um, you know, deliver care and what are the, some of the biases that we may have and that we really have to uh, think about um, as we make decisions about whether to implement uh, data which is evidence-based or not. So just in general about um, guidelines, uh, they should be evidence-based, unbiased, innovative when appropriate, uh, consistent across issuing organizations, although this is um, sometimes really hard to get everybody around the world to agree. Uh, easy to understand, but comprehensive enough to uh, account for the complexities of the condition that's being guided and looked at. Um, easy to implement, and cognizant of the way that clinicians think about benefits and risks of treatment. So this is really actually, I think, a new um, actually, yeah, I've given this part, the first four things, five things, bullets for, you know, many years, but I'm really getting more interested in the concept about, uh, and part of it's because of the work that I do, like as head of the physician organization and chief medical officer, about how we think and, you know, what are the behaviors that we're willing to do and not willing to do, um, and what are the things that influence when we implement something or not. So uh, these are the areas that I want to go over. Uh, recent guidelines, how did we get here, uh, where we're going with it, and then also uh, focus on what's really emerging, both in general in, in cardiology and in other fields as well, about using risk-based treatment evidence. So here are the recent ACCAHA guidelines. I think it's a good start. So if you look across the top, what you see were what we had up until 2017. Uh, and what the shift that occurred with the 2017 uh, definitions uh, was that normal blood pressure stayed the same, but the concept of prehypertension uh, went away. And uh, the new definitions are elevated blood pressure between 120 to 129 and less than 80. And then now calling it stage one hypertension, 130 to 139, over to 80 to 80 to 9. And that's really taking into account the epidemiological data, which we've known you know, since Framingham you know, 40 years ago, 30, well, probably around 20, 25 years ago, and now is being replicated you know, in other uh, cohorts as well across the world, that there's a linear relationship between blood pressure and cardiovascular events starting at around 110. Right, so 110, 120, 130, 140, 150, you get more events. So you know, it was decided, well, let's move down then the uh, cut point in which we say people have hypertension to 130. We could have said 120, could have said 110, because 
you know, it's, I guess the risk is linear, but, you know, 130 was, is a pretty reasonable place to say that, you know, that's where you start to have hypertension. And then stage one and stage two uh, were collapsed just into you know, one stage called stage two hypertension, which is now greater than 140 over 90. So what happened, you can see uh, in the red here, is that when we went from uh, this new prehypertension to hypertension, we now said there are 31.1 more uh, million Americans who now have hypertension, which caused a lot of conflict, um, especially like organizations like the American College of Physicians are not accepting this, right? Because they're saying you're labeling people with a medical disease and with a medical illness, and you know there isn't really uh, much evidence to say that they should go lower than 140. So what are you even telling them they should be that they have hypertension? So we'll go over that because I think that there is some validity to that concept, and I mean, and that's some of the work that we've done. Uh, and then this, we're still left with about the 72.2 million Americans who have hypertension from the old guidelines. So, and then what's the treatment then that's been recommended based on that? So you can see on the left, normal blood pressure continued to promote optimal uh, lifestyle habits for the. A group now that's elevated uh, blood pressure, again, non-pharmacological treatment. Stage one, so this is where there's um, some com controversy, and, that, and we've contributed to that, uh, which I think in a good way, and I'll be talking about that later, which is now if you go down to, you know, if you have atherosclerotic coronary vascular disease or diabetes or CKD, or what the guidelines are saying is a 10-year cardiovascular risk based on the pool cohort equations, which you know I can show you how you calculate that in a minute, greater than 10%, then you should actually be less than 130. If you don't have those, you know, then they're saying, well, maybe um, 130 over 80 is a reasonable target, maybe not. You can decide what you want to do. So we'll go over that in a little bit more. So how did we get here? So uh, these came about through... Uh, trials on high-risk patients over the past 30 years, and I think it's worth going over them. So these are the uh, trials I want to go over, studies in elderly populations, studies in patients with uh, hypertensive kidney disease, uh, uh, studies in patients with diabetes, and then the SPRINT trial, which was a uh, study in high-risk patients without diabetes. So let's look at these studies in the elderly population. So the, uh, these are the ones I want to go over, the SHEP. So SHEP was uh, done almost two and a half, about 25 years ago already at this point. And uh, at that time, um, it was thought that actually you needed to have a high blood pressure to get blood to the brain uh, in elderly people in order to enable them to keep thinking. Okay, so it was thought that, uh, and so, so this was really, a, so it was a placebo trial which was ethical because actually there was a, there was really was equipoise at that point around whether lowering blood pressure was a good idea or a bad idea. So uh, the patients were included if they had um, isolated systolic hypertension with systolic blood pressure to 160 to, to 219, and then they were randomized to um, being treated, and you can see that the treated group was 143 over 68, the placebo group went to 155 over 72. So there was a 36% reduction, percent reduction in strokes, 32% reduction in cardiovascular events, and then 27% reduction in non-fatal MI. And all-cause mortality also was reduced. Uh, no, uh, there were actually fewer SAEs in the treatment group. Fractures, which people were really worried about, they, th they thought that we were gonna you know, create all these more hip fractures. Um, were actually no different. And orthostatic hypertension was not different uh, between um, the groups based on medication status. So then Cystura came along, and that was the European response to SHEP. Uh, and again, it, because there was considered there wasn't enough data, it was placebo controlled. Uh, and the achieved blood pressure was 151 over 80, placebo 161 over 60, 86. And results, 40, again, it's very similar to SHEP, so I'm not going to go through them. Uh, and then HIVIT, so again, another placebo-controlled trial uh, that was done mainly in Northern Europe. And uh, it was then in people over the age of 80, because the thought was, OK, well, we've looked at people in their 60s. What about people at 80? Does it really matter? 
And again, uh, patients were uh, randomized if they had isolated systolic hypertension. Oh, actually, this group could have had some diastolic hypertension too. And they were treated to 145 over 77, 159 over 84. And again, you see, this was somewhat unexpected. You know, 30% reduction in stroke, 39% reduction in stroke death. And what was really unexpected was in you know, people over the age of 80 was that there was even a reduction in mortality. So, uh, you know, impressive that um, treating to um, less than 150 even reduced mortality in people over the age of 80. And again, there were fewer SAEs in the treatment group. So I think the synthesis of the elderly trials is, is that um, less, a goal of less than 150 is beneficial compared to high levels of blood pressure. And, uh, yeah, and I think if you look across all organizations, just everybody agrees with this. So we had a publication in Jack about uh, four months ago. Um, I, initial title I wanted to have was, Can't We All Get Along? And, uh, but really what it basically said was, look, we, we all agree that less than 150 is a reasonable goal. American College of Physicians can do that. Family practice docs can agree with that. Everybody can agree with that. And we're, um, we still have so many millions of people, not only just in the United States, but around the world, who are not even at that level, that let's shoot for that. You know, let's say, okay, let's get everybody under 150. And that would have an enormous effect um, you know, in, in terms of preventing stroke, heart attack, and renal disease. Um, in, worldwide. So the uh, next big high-risk population that was looked at, um, because then people started to say, oh, hey, well, you know, we've got this down in people who don't have comorbid conditions. Now let's start to look at people who have comorbid conditions. So the uh, African-American study of kidney disease and hypertension was organized, and I had the good fortune to be one of the principal investigators on this. And uh, it's still the largest um, trial that was um, done in African Americans. And, you know, when people tell you, like, that the NIH doesn't do really good things or that it takes so long, studies like this would never be done by industry. You know, they, they'd never be, you know, and I'm all for industry doing things, but types of things that are, um, that don't have monetary value at the end, but really impact, you know, how we live, you know, and, uh, you know, or, you know, or need to be done you know, by uh, uh, unbiased uh, sources, you know, and that's really what the role of government should be, right? I mean, to do this type of stuff that benefits the population. So um, this study was done and uh, it was looking to see, you know, what was the impact of lowering blood pressure and also which drugs were better in patients who, with chronic kidney disease. Uh, and we had done a, um, a pilot study in which we had biopsied, pe biopsied people um, before we did this big study, so we knew that actually it was hypertensive kidney disease. I mean, you know, 98% of the time. Occasionally, you know, you'll get somebody who's got some glomerular nephritis, but that's really uh, uh, very rare. So those, these were the outcomes. And these were the two blood pressure goals, uh, less than 140 over 90, and basically less than 130 over 80. And then there were three antihypertensive regimens, uh, dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, ACE inhibitor, and beta blocker. And I think also another, I think, really important uh, lesson from this trial, which was important to me as a relatively, uh, you know, I, I was a, basically then, a, I guess, a junior or mid-level investigator at that point, was that, um, you know, why it's important to do randomized trials. Because at this point, you know, it was known that calcium channel blockers were really effective agents in African Americans for lowering blood pressure. And uh, we had about $80 million in our, you know, to do our study. And uh, the NIH said to us, well, you know, if you want to figure out a way to maybe save some money, figure it out. So a lot of people in the group said, let's not study the dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker because we know that's going to work. So let's see, like, ACE inhibitor versus beta blocker, because at that point, and I still think this is actually, you know, if you look to see you know, how long does it take to get dissemination of data and how long does it take to, uh, to break down biases that were created maybe very early. So, you know, it was thought that angiotensin, that the ACE inhibitors weren't going to work because there was data that was working in diabetics, but they were white people. But, you know, ACE inhibitors on their own don't work in African Americans too well without addition of a calcium channel blocker or a diuretic. So it was thought, ah, the ACE inhibitor arm's not going to work. So, but um, several of us said, no, let's keep all three in because, you know, we don't really know. 
We don't know which is going to work. So here's what happened. So the blood, so this, so achieved blood pressure was really different in the groups, and this was really, uh, really, really beneficial. Um, but also, you know, if I'm talking about behavioral economics, you know, the, um, uh, you know, just an insight into how things occur in studies. So I was um, head of uh, recruitment for the study, and then I became head of adherence. You know, so I was very invested, in, you know, in the study. And we were we found that um, that the group that was lower blood pressure goals were requiring really high doses of furosemide, 120 milligrams a day, 160 milligrams a day. And as a cardiologist, I was pretty used to that. That you know, fine, that's okay. But a lot of nephrologists didn't want to do it. Um, but so we, but we weren't. So there were a lot of sites across the country where we weren't getting good separation of blood pressure. So I decided to use, I mean, I, you know, I've been pretty good at this for a long time. That's why I got to be like this um, chief physician executive, you know, using financial incentives and sometimes carrots and sticks. So, um, uh, you know, I called the people, I called up the groups that were not doing it. And I think I got permission from the NIH to do this, but, pro but probably didn't. And I said to them, listen, you know, if you don't bump your furosemide dose up to 160 milligrams a day in all your patients, we're taking your money away. So guess what? They all bumped their for also my dose up to 160 milligrams a day. Um, so I think, you know, just in the theme I'm talking about, you know, how you make decisions about things and how you implement stuff. I mean, there are, you know, there are different carrots and sticks that you want to use. Um, and I'm actually proud of that one. So, um, the, so here's what happened with the uh, data, for, you know, the uh, ACE inhibitor beta blocker or, or calcium channel blocker. So we stopped the study early because the calcium channel blocker was leading to faster rates of decline in renal function, unexpected. So thank goodness that we didn't take the calcium channel blocker out of the trial, because then people would have been exposed for another 25 years to just dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. Because remember, economics count, that was the most prescribed drug at that point, because Pfizer was doing an unbelievable job at marketing you know, they, uh, at that point, they had gotten off of nifedipine gits, which was a great drug, and they had switched over to amlodipine because they were making a lot more money on it because they had developed that. And so it would have been that this would have been what was given for 25 years. So, you know, then we went on and we found out, surprisingly, to everybody's surprise, the ACE inhibitor in African Americans turned out to be the best drug. So I still don't think, so, you know, that was, so that was 20, no, that was already like, that was 16, 17 years ago. I still don't think that this stuff's been really disseminated, right? It just hasn't been. So I can tell you is that since probably most people are still using dihydropyridine, you know, unopposed dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers in African Americans, don't do it. And if you're going to do it, definitely end it on an ACE inhibitor, Okay. And I'm not going to show all the data for this, but what we know is what's happening is that the, the dihydropyridine is causing a, a probably is causing probably glomerular leak, you know, and there's um, and so there's much more proteinuria. So you know we have a lot of data showing that the the increase in proteinuria that occurs is directly related to the um, default, decline in renal function. So then, uh, what about uh, long-term blood pressure control? So we were uh, fortunate. Um, that we were able to uh, get funding to uh, study this group for um, a prolonged period of time. And uh, what we found was, I think there are a couple of interesting things here. One is that if you look at the um, graph on the bottom, the lines on the bottom, so you can see these are people with um, less than 300 milligrams uh, per day of uh, protein. And you can see that um, although there's an inexorable decline in renal function and um, events of ESRD or going on dialysis, uh, it's relatively, you know, you, you won't want to have a 30% rate at this point, but it's much less than the group that's greater than the 300. So if you have, if you have proteinuria, that's really, you know, doesn't really, it, that, it's independent really of your blood pressure. I mean, that's, if you have proteinuria, you're going to go on to um, many more events. And you can see, I mean, this is, you know, pretty horrible, right? I mean, you know, 70, 80 percent event rate. The good news is, is that what it looks like, though, is that there's some, uh, uh, if you, if, in people whose blood pressure was lower to less than 130 over 80, then they have um, an absolute difference of 10 percent in the rate of going on to either ES or D or having a, um, a renal event, 
So that's about, so the number needed to treat is only 10, which is really, really low, as you know, for, um, uh, for medical treatment. Okay, so what about ACCORD? So then ACCORD trial um, was done um, in uh, patients with diabetes who, uh, and the idea was to look at type two, and the idea was to see, again, to see, okay, intensive versus non-intensive. Um, and uh, there's another study, little t a tidbit I wanna give people who are coming up on this one. Um, I decided not to get into this trial, and the reason why I didn't was because I didn't like the protocol, and I didn't like that they weren't adding diuretic. Um, and there are some people in my group who said, no, no, get in anyway, you'll get the thing, and you'll, change, you'll be able to change the protocol. But I wasn't so sure, so I didn't want to put the effort in. So guess what? So we didn't apply, they got in, and the protocol was changed. So my advice to you then is, is that you know, get, into, you know, get into the game. You know, and because once you're in, you could be influential, and I would have preferred to have been an investigator rather than to be person up here telling you about the study from, you know, just as having read it in the in New England Journal of Medicine like everybody else. I'd rather have been in it. So, you know, being in the game is important. Um, so this was, uh, the outcome was um, intensive um, group again, was really good blood pressure separation from the standard group. And here's um, what happened in terms of outcome. So what you can see is that uh, there was no difference in the primary outcome, uh, which was MI, non-fatal non stroke, or death. So it was a, co a combination outcome. Um, how, however, they had a pre-specified secondary outcome, which was stroke reduction, just on its own. Uh, the New England Journal of Medicine would not accept this paper if they said that there was an impact of uh, less than 120 versus less than 140 on stroke and said it was a positive study. They said, uh-uh, you didn't, the primary outcome wasn't achieved. JAMA would have accepted it, but the investigators wanted in the New Journal of Medicine, which I think Anthony did a disservice, and uh, because the, the reality is th this was a pre-specified outcome, and the, you can see even though the vent rate was kind of low, it was still, and the number needed to treat is pretty high. It still shows that if you go less than 120 versus less than 140, then um, you had benefit. But what, it did, but what happened was, is then it prevented the uh, American Diabetes Association from coming out with a guideline to lower people to less than 120 or, you know, or, or, or the equivalent office blood pressure is 130 for like about 15 years until our study came out, which I'll talk about later, which then pushed them into saying, okay, you know, if you have high risk, you should be less than, you know, less than 130. Okay, so what about Sprint? So then Sprint came along, um, and on this one, I'd learned my lesson on Accord, so I said, I'm getting in on this one, and we can change the protocol if we want to. So, um, so Sprint was done in uh, people who were now um, had high cardiovascular risk, it was figured out, the diabetes thing, had already, they fig, people figured out, okay, we, cord was already figured out, we don't include diabetics, but we don't have enough data on patients with chronic kidney disease, um, so let's include patients with chronic kidney disease. Um, and also, uh, so you can have, a, you got in, if you had clinical CVD, a Framingham risk score of 15%, a chronic kidney disease, age over 75, uh, and then if you had had a stroke or diabetes, you were excluded. So, uh, and then we looked at less than 120 versus less than 140. So again, really good separation of blood pressure. And you gotta give all these groups really, really good credit. I mean, for, you know, for the pet, it, people have really learned how to, how to do this, and it really makes all the difference in the world. Um, you know, because studies that had been done earlier, when there were just like four millimeter differences between groups that were supposed to be 10 millimeter differences, you really couldn't tell. But here, these are really big differences in, uh, in blood pressure. And you know, as I'm sure you know, so that overall there was a 25% reduction in cardiovascular events and the composite outcome in people who uh, were treated intensively um, versus the standard treatment group. And if you take this into number needed to treat, it's 90 to prevent one death and um, you know, 61 to prevent one primary outcome. And and at this point, I also got to stop to say, you know, I want to give 
uh, internists and um, cardiologists a lot of credit because I gave this talk to a group of surgeons and they came up to me and they said, are you kidding me? You do all this work just to, you know, you have to treat 90 people or to, to really have an outcome? We treat one person and have an outcome. So I said, yes, that is, you know, but we have a long-term view. Um, you know, we treat thousands of people, you know, so, but, it, but it's a different head. You know, it's a really different head. And I, and I want to commend you all for, you know, being able to view these things in this large population, statistically, you know, based view. Keep it up. So, um, so then let's say, so these are then the subpopulations. So these were predefined subpopulations that were looked at. And you can see that um, if you, this is, a, you know, of course, a forest plot. And what you see is that intensive treatment that was, uh, was always better, although there, there weren't enough people in some of the groups to, um, to uh, say that there were, and so the confidence intervals were, were a little wide, went over one. Um, and uh, it, it was interesting, so then if you look to see what's the p-value for interaction, so that's a test to look to see was there any interaction between the group you were in and the outcome, and there wasn't any. So that, so that means that there was no heterogeneity of effect. For the p-value, let's say the p-value for, you know, here on, uh, for women, for sex, had been um, 0.01. Well, that would have said that actually there is a signal that men respond to the treatment, but women don't. So I think you're going to already tell I'm not somebody who's averse to controversy. So um, I am, uh, uh, the, the, I'm not for doing another big study, including just on women, to look to see whether these results come out. Because, and there are a lot of women who are. Because uh, I think it's, it's going to come out to show that lowering blood pressure to less than 120 overall for women is the same as it is for men. And, you know, because I, I believe in the statistical test. Okay, there was no heterogeneity. So, what, but you can also see, I think importantly, and this is a theme I really want to now start pushing for the rest of this talk, which is that. You know, the, the people at the highest risk generally tend, and who benefit the most, and a lot of things we do, and this happens in the cath lab, this is, happens in, you know, it, it, that um, people at the highest risk who benefit the most from treatment, a lot of times we don't give it to them because we're afraid of the uh, outcomes, which, of the adverse events, which they have more of. There's no question about it. So we tend to give things to people at lower cardiovascular risk you know, who were, um, you know, or who won't have an outcome. I mean, I won't have an adverse outcome. So uh, you can see here, even people over the age of 75, they did, you know, uh, definitely better. I mean, as, and it looks like, you know, then the, the intensely treated group did better. So, um, in, again, in Sprint, there was no significant difference in all cause SAEs by treatment group. Um, however, the intensive group had higher incidence of hypotension, syncope, acute injury, and renal failure. So these are not, so these actually are not insignificant events. So overall, SAEs were the same, but, you know, higher incidence of hypotension, syncope, acute renal injury, and renal failure. Um, and then if you look at this data, and you put it across the, you know, just across the United States, good news is, prevent over 100,000 deaths per year, which is just about better than we can do just about with anything, and uh, 46,000 cases of heart failure. However, we're going to see more cases of hypotension, more serious electrolyte disorders, and almost 90,000 cases of acute kidney injury. So a colleague of mine uh, wrote me last month and said, Rob, I'm an internal medicine physician and treat patients for hypertension. I do, in fact, feel a sense of not wanting to hurt a patient that seems to be doing OK with a systolic blood pressure of less than 130. There is definitely a present day bias as well as loss aversion. So what that means, so I'm taking a course with this person on behavioral economics at Penn. So this is where these words come from. I'm more afraid of losing something that I'm excited about, a potential gain, even though I'm familiar with the literature. So generally, you know, what behavioral economics teaches us is that um, if we're faced with a choice, you know, of a bet or, you know, or, or something in the stock market or something with something of like you may lose versus you may gain, people tend to, they defend their position. 
and don't want to have the loss. So, you know, so in this situation would be is, is that, you know, when you're the treating physician and you have, you know, you, and it's better to lower it to less than 130, but that's a 10 year out, right? The, and you may, and you know, you're going to prevent a stroke, prevent, prevent a heart attack, prevent kidney disease, but you're not going to see that. But you lower to less than 130, and the patient has syncope. When they walk out, out of your office, you feel like you have done that, right? Even though in the aggregate, you know, it's better, you know, the treatment's better. So, you know, that's, that's one of the issues that we face. So this is, you know, a, the, a treatment risk paradox, which is not um, just um, unique to hypertension treatment. So the patients at the highest risk are frequently treated less often than those at lower risk. Uh, and we need to find ways to integrate this into how we practice so that we can, you know, be comfortable uh, with treating people with high risk who may have more serious adverse events uh, and but in the long run benefit. So I think one of the ways to do that uh, is to really better define um, who are the groups really that benefit and those who don't. So. I think that's the contribution that we've made on this is you know, creating a, a, a new um, statistical way of looking to see, okay, who can, you dis who can really get benefit, who's gonna get harm, and then can you develop a benefit to harm ratio that then allows you to uh, you know, better stratify who you wanna treat and give more precision medicine. So, and where this has come from, is uh, you know a movement that's it was in Europe. It's been in Europe for quite a while now, but it's getting to the United States in about the past ten years, which was is to take into account you know the concept of global risk. You know what's the total risk that that patient has for a cardiovascular event, uh, and so based on that, remember the as you all know the um, LDL goals um, for treatment for LDL used to be to hit a certain goal. Then in the 2013 guidelines. What came out was to say, no, let's actually modify our intensity of treatment based on what the risk is. So if the 10-year risk is uh, greater than 5%, um, you know, then, um, then you go for moderate treatment, but if it's greater than 7.5% intensive treatment. And then the 2018 guidelines um, have uh, incorporated both risk and LDL goals intensive treatment. Because remember what happened was is that many of us thought that taking away the LDL goal was not a good idea. So here's what I wrote to the New York Times, and the, this was published in the Times in um, 2013. And uh, at that point, I think I was treasurer of the American Society of Hypertension, and we had decided uh, that we were not gonna support the new cholesterol guidelines. And the reason why we decided we weren't gonna support them is because we didn't think it was a good idea to take away the concept of, of a goal. Um, so we said that the new guidelines argued that focus on goals is misguided. Um, since clinical trials only studied efficacy of statin dose and not specific LDL goals. Um, however, both, equivalent, both approaches are equivalent since there's a direct relationship between statin dose and LDL reduction. So it was exactly the same. I mean, it was, yeah, the trials had been designed to study dose, but there was, a, there was an obvious dose effect. And also, you know, it wasn't, if, it, and that's true for matter of what you use, statin, resin, you know, I'm old enough to use those things. So, you know, so clearly it was, you know, LDL level was related to um, events and re reduction of LDL level, no matter how you got there, was important. So we didn't think it was a good idea to get rid of the LDL uh, goal approach as well. And, uh, and I'm really glad to see that the guidelines kind of responded to, you know, that's one of the goals I had right at the beginning of the talk was to talk about, you know, the guidelines should also take into account how we practice and you know, how we think. And so I'm really glad that they've put back into the guideline now uh, incorporating risk, but also an LDL goal. So you know, risk is really easy to do. You know, you know this is cardiology groups, so you all know how to do this. And you know, the pool corridor equations you have on your calculator, or this is what we used to have in Athena, um, it, and we now have an EPIC as well. So you, you, know, you put in various factors, and you come up with what the um, cardiovascular risk is for that patient. So there's a lot of support for risk, uh, for risk dependent impact of blood pressure lowering. So if you see here, this is, this is the 10 year predicted CV risk at the same level of blood pressure. You can see it varies 30 fold. So if you know that you can be 110 versus 130, but depending on what all your risk factors are, so what's your total global risk, you, know, you can you know, be 
have a systolic blood pressure, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, okay, but you know, of, of 110 with a lot of other risk factors and have a lot more chance of having a 10-year cardiovascular event than somebody who's 130. And, and the other interesting thing is, is that the, 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 what's the impact of blood pressure reduction? It varies as a function of the baseline cardiovascular risk. So if you look here um, on the z-axis, the five-year risk of cardiovascular event, less than 11 to greater than 21. And you can see that, I mean, this is, and this is systolic blood pressure reduction on the x-axis and, and on the y is cardiovascular events per 1,000. And you can see that for uh, each um, a different level of risk, so 11% versus 21%, um, a five millimeter reduction in blood pressure for the less than 11% only has around a 5%, only re, um, reduces um, you know, events five per 100,000. But if you're greater than 21%, 19 per 100,000. And it's true throughout. So systolic blood pressure reduction of 18, if your incoming five-year risk is 11%, you know, that the, um, the uh, cardiovascular risks events avoided are only 18 here, but 69 here. So what your incoming risk profile uh, is has a lot of impact on what the impact of therapy will be. So we then said, okay, well, if you take this all into account, because there was a lot of controversy that was coming out when the 2017 guidelines came out. People said, are you kidding me? I'm gonna have to lower people over the age of 75 to less than 120 or less than 130. So less, I'm, I'm not gonna, and I'm gonna use 130 here is because the, that's the office equivalent. The, the um, 130 is the office equivalent of what 120 was in the study. Are you kidding me? I'm gonna have to do this? Uh, it's, uh, I'm not gonna do it. So I thought, okay, well, what if we were able to come up with a more refined approach? You know, so tell you the people who would really, really benefit. So uh, working with people here in our research institute, um, we said, well, um, you know, can we dis identify a group who with intensive treatment might have exceptional benefit uh, with the least amount of harm? So we um, developed a predictive model of benefit versus harm for 10-year risk. And uh, what we found was, this is the, you know, the key slide, was that um, if you look now from the first quartile of risk in this study, so these were, you know, so we took the sprint trial, we split them up into quartiles, uh, and this, is a high, general, you know, by definition, is a high risk group, right? But there were, you know, there was a whole one quarter of the patients, who were around 2,500 of them, had a 10 year predicted risk of less than 11.5%. And you can see here that the benefit to harm ratio was 0.5, so more harm than benefit. Same thing, 11.5 to 18.1 more harm than benefit. However, once you cross basically 18% threshold, threshold and 98% of people over the age of 75 are in this group, then there's way more benefit by being treated to less than 130 than less than 140. And if you're in the fourth quartile, you know, fivefold. So then what we're recommending is, is that um, it says the blood pressure less than 130 in this group and um, less than 140 in this group. So I've been called irresponsible by a lot of my friends in the guidelines because they're thinking like, you know, this is going to confuse people. Um, that's not what I've been hearing from people. I think that this is actually making it so, you know, more easy to say, okay, you know, because one thing I've learned in the job that I do is that uh, physicians don't like to be told what to do and physicians like to have a choice. So I think that basically what we're now saying, yeah, there's a choice. That, um, that less than 130 over 80 isn't for everybody, but it's definitely for people who are at high risk for um, a cardiovascular event. So this did have some impact um, on the diabetes guidelines. You know, so they quote us by saying that um, they're now saying that um, it's very, it's before, you know, based on a cord, they weren't willing to go less than 140. But now they're saying the benefit from blood pressure reduction, uh, as shown in this in the analysis of the sprint trial by this group, you know, says that going to less than 130 is a good idea if the 10-year cardiovascular risk is high. You know, greater than they're saying greater than 18 percent, 15 percent. So we'd say 18, but that's equivalent. Okay, so what are some of the subsequent studies? So, the, uh, so this just came out last month in JAMA. Um, so one of the 
uh, sub-studies of the SPRINT trial with SPRINT MIND, and um, you can see how far we've come from the 1980s where we thought that 190 blood pressure was a really good thing to have in order to keep cognitive function. So now we're saying, wait a minute, how about, let's, what's the difference between the group that's randomized to less than 120 versus the less than 140 of cognitive function, and we're also, we're doing MRIs. So what, what it shows is, is that there was, um, if you looked at probable uh, dementia, there was no difference. However, um, if you take into account probable dementia and mild the cognitive impairment, uh, then it was, there was a benefit for going to less than uh, 120. It was less than 120, but that would be less than 130. So you can see here that, um, that, that benefit, so lo lower is better for preserving cognitive function. So what, I think, what do I think the implications are? So um, high-risk patients um, experience more benefit if you go to less than 130 over 80. Patients over 75 have substantial benefit from intensive treatment. Uh, you know, it, by new ACC guidelines, there, there will be around 10 million more people who will be lowered to less than 130 if you use the 10% cutoff. Um, we think that that is unnecessary. Um, however, uh, cognitive decline may be blunted by treatment to less than 130, but what we don't know and what they didn't publish yet, um, and I don't know if they could give me access to the data, is um, whether this is dependent on baseline cardiovascular risk, because that's what needs to be determined, just in the same way that we did it um, for the total sprint trial. I think it needs to be seen, uh, is it that the people who have a lot of cardiovascular risk are the ones who are benefiting for going you know, less, than, you know, less than 130, and maybe the rest of the people can be less than 140. So you know, here's um, our take on where the guidelines should shift is that if the 10-year risk is now greater than 18, instead of 10%, so we, we agree on this one, AES, CVD, diabetes, kidney disease, lower than everybody less than 130. But where our, um, our differences is on where, with the guideline committee um, is uh, greater than 18%, we think that that's the cutoff where it should be. And for those people, go less than 130. But if it's less than that, well, less than 140. So remember that the American College of Physicians still doesn't agree with this. You know, they don't think there's enough data to say that anybody should be less than 130. They're still saying less than 150. Uh, and I don't think that's so terrible, as I said when I started this. I mean, that, you know, we have millions and millions and millions of people who aren't even under 150. So we should certainly be willing to try to get everybody 150 and putting all sorts of things in place to make that happen. So one of the things is the Target BB program, which the uh, American Heart Association is um, really pushing, and we have a big program um, in Houston um, that's collaboration among um, us, Kelsey Siebold, UT, tons of, um, of the um, federally qualified health clinics across the city to put in place lowering people. We're trying to get everybody to less than 140, and that's um, you know, a really, really, really important goal. So what about biases? So what are the ones that you know, we have? So you know, we all have biases that we bring to you know, how we um, uh, treat people and live our daily lives. So you know, we should consider you know, both good and, good and bad and the likely input, uh, impact when we make a clinical decision. Uh, but here are the biases that prevent this evidence-based approach. So present bias. So even as physicians, even though we're pretty good you know, at, um, at, at risk assessment, you know, we weigh short-term outcomes, so potential out adverse outcome. Person walks outside your office, falls on their face. Over long-term, you know, that 75-year-olds overall are going to benefit from lower blood pressure goals because they'll have reduced stroke, heart attack, kidney dysfunction. Uh, status quo bias. We tend to think, well, if something's okay today, it's going to be okay in the future. Uh, regret aversion. So we, we don't want this to happen. We generally try to avert you know, something that we've made a choice about and look back at it and say, hmm, woulda, shoulda, coulda. If I could only have done that differently, the event, you know, outcome may have been different. So we don't want to actually create an adverse event. And you know, we, we prefer not to lose what we currently have, which is the patients in front of you, they look okay. And you, know, you don't want to then do something um, you know, adverse to them. So you can't end the hypertension talk uh, without, um, because this is usually for, you know, give these things for 30 years, and the first question I get, I do all this complicated stuff, analysis, you know, statistics, and somebody raises their hand and says, 
hey, what's the initial choice for blood pressure medication? So, uh, which is fair. So here's what it is. So now it's just, you know, anything you want, just as long as it lowers the blood pressure. Uh, although I would still say that in people who have a kidney dysfunction, uh, don't give them um, unopposed um, dihydropyridine, you know, without an ACE inhibitor on board. And I'll take um, questions if you have them. I really appreciate your attention. That was a spectacular presentation. Uh, we've got several questions. We'll start with Dr. Cook. Well, that was great. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, my question is related oh, to the risk factor-based uh, enhancing or refining therapy based on the risk factor. Yeah. It seems as though, it seems as though the uh, risk factor-based assessment uh, of whether to institute therapy uh, that you recommend would Im improve our outcomes. We'd, we'd reduce the number needed to treat. Right. We'd reduce adverse outcomes. Right. Um, is it, with, with that uh, compelling evidence, uh, should we be getting some guidance uh, uh, automatically? I mean, can, in your position as a, a CMO, I mean, couldn't you uh, uh, put this into the EPIC system, some guidance uh, for us in treatment of our patients to help us get over the biases that we have? Yeah that you outlined. Yeah, so here's, so, so to, to Dr. Cook's point, so here's the data on number needed to treat, right? I mean, based on risk. Look how dramatically it goes down, right? I mean, number needed to treat to prevent one all-cause mortality. First quartile, 331. Fourth quartile, 44. Even for us as internal medicine people, that's a big difference. I know the, the surgeons will go, until you get it to one, I'm not doing any of this thing, you know, but yes, okay, yeah, I, I mean, with support, yes, I, I'm, just, here's what I think we can do. We can at least put this data in to say, hey, you know, this is what it looks like. This is the risk, and here's the number needed to treat. I think that would be fair. And one follow-up question. Um, the number needed to treat depends upon, um, of course, your endpoint, and the right. endpoints that we typically are using are mortality and MACE. Um, but it really, another important outcome that you mentioned today was is dementia. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, would we have a, a reduction in the number needed to treat if we were preventing a, a, a vascular dementia? Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, yeah, I, it, well, it's, it's, yeah, looks like we would. I mean, at least cognitive decline. Yep. Yeah, hey, Rob. <clears throat> Seems so simple, the concept that lower pressure is better than higher pressure. <laughs> The problem that I have is that when I when my patients measure their blood pressure right. over a month, say yeah. morning and night, right. it's all over the place, mm -hmm. and I'm not quite sure what their blood pressure right. is. Right. So how do you arrive at a sure. number? All these studies seem so simple, one thirty right. below that. Yeah, but it's not that simple. Well, here's one thing I'm actually quite embarrassed about having been here for six years and being one of the people who really. Um, started ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, and we were the ones that showed, we, we did the early studies showing that early diastolic dysfunction occurs at 130 over 85 on 24-hour ambulatory monitoring. And that's now become like the standard, right? We don't do it. So, so the average blood pressure was the important thing. 24-hour blood pressure monitoring, we, we should be, we should have a thousand monitors, you know, in the Houston Methodist system so that we can just do, you know, home, we can just do a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure, see what the average blood pressure is, because that's really highly predictive. Notwithstanding that, you know, home blood pressures are, you know, are probably the, are the better pressure, you know, especially because we don't do it right. You know, I mean, you come into the office, I don't know what you do in your practice, but if your practice is similar to most, you know, the patient comes in, they've rushed in, they've parked in, you know, Smith or Skurlock, you know, they've, somebody's almost hit their car, they're freaking out, and you come in and, you know, and you sit down and the MA comes in and like takes the blood pressure. You know, I make them, I say to them, listen, I know this is, you know, you want, uh, here's, here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to sit here. I'm supposed to sit for two minutes. I'm sit uh, five minutes. I'm going to sit for two. Okay. And you'll take my blood pressure. And then, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take it again. So, but that doesn't happen. But, you know, so, we, you know, so we, we don't get good. I, and look, we've been... I, 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 I don't want to give up on this one, but, you know, we don't take good blood, good blood pressures in the office. So I'd, I'd say, you know, home blood pressure monitoring, I, I would take those numbers. Those are the ones I would take. And actually, I'm trying to, I really want to, um, there's this uh, 
company that I really want to work with. Um, the guy that um, developed um, well, all scripts is now, uh, for personal reasons, um, and I'm, t I'm not telling tales out of school because he tells this story. He has a kid now with type 1 diabetes. And so he's really interested in um, developing very uh, easy to use um, uh, wireless device. And we use a lot of them anyway, but that, you know, for glucose and blood pressure monitoring. And I think that if we instituted that across um, all our practices and system, uh, we would really be getting a lot better data. With the first couple studies you showed, it struck me that it could be the drugs that are reducing the mortality right. and not definitely the blood pressure. Right. The blood pressure is kind of a marker, right. like cholesterol is a marker for the cardiovascular risk. Right. And the more drugs you give, the lower the risk. Right. That's so, absolutely. So, uh, but the only the, the counterpoint to that though was is the Thomas trial. So the trial of mild hypertension study that was done like in the early '80s, and that was a non pharmacological intervention and showed that lower blood you know, lowering blood pressure actually reduced cardiovascular events. So the probably combination, probably some, some probably some drugs are better than others. Like okay, chlorothaladone definitely better than hydrochlorothiazide for cardiovascular events. So there's definitely some drug effect. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say was that this kind of alludes to it, that the benefit of lowering the blood pressure from 170 to 150 is probably much greater than the benefit from lowering it from 140 to 120. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I, I think it's kind of linear, but, but, um, but uh, I'll go with that. So because the lower the blood pressure, the lower the cardiovascular risk. So they would be in lower yeah. percentiles. Yeah, definitely. So I think that we yeah. should emphasize you know, the importance of treating it, especially when it's very high. Yeah, no, I think it's a really, really important point. And I try to end every editorial of something that I write by going, hey, listen, let's stop fighting about 130 versus 140. Let's get everybody from 170 to less than 150, OK? Um, yeah, uh, this, this is a question. Uh, within each uh, systolic target, 120, 130, 140, uh, if they have a secondary cause, you know, uh, primary aldosterone, yeah, yeah, for yeah. example, they will have complications right. even if the pressure is controlled. Correct. So I want to ask if, if you have any recommendations with regard to who should be screened yeah. for uh, primary aldosteronism. Yeah, yeah. Because the so, endocrine, okay. there's a big um, debate going on in the endocrine world now. Right, right. right. Um, so you, why don't you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it, it's leaning towards... I may, I may be combative, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> yeah. The endocrine society listed six conditions, so complicated you can't do it. And, and now there's a movement to just test everybody yeah. that has hypertension and just yeah. by measuring... Uh, yeah, aldosterone and renin activity. Yeah, I don't think it's a bad idea because, I mean, the thing is, you know, we used to think like that it was a, you have to have, be hypokalemic to have hyperaldosteronism, and that's not true. So, you know, you can have, um, have a high aldosterone state, um, you know, and have a high aldo to renin ratio uh, and uh, without being hypokalemic. So, uh, you know, I think that's, and the you know the the and the the aldosterone antagonists uh, are are effective in lowering blood pressure and many people who don't seem to have hyperaldosteronism. So you know there may be you know receptors that are vasoconstricting receptors that we can't even figure out that are active in some people, but we'd be responding to you know an anti-aldosterone agent. Thanks for bringing it up. Okay, last two questions. Uh, what about those that are below the age of 40 or 50 and do not have hypertension? Do you think it's worthwhile for them to have a systolic of 100 versus 120? Is that, would that no, impact their yeah. lifetime risk, or is that worth studying? Or? Yeah, I mean, um, I, nobody's ever going to do that study. I mean, I, I can guarantee you that the less than 120 is, you know, the sprint, there's nothing going to be after sprint. Mm. You know, so I think 120 is the lowest you're going to see. I, I, you know, can I just say one thing about Dr. Razor's question again? Um, so, you know, there is like a lot of data now about um, that's emerging around uh, variability of blood pressure. And we showed like that in the African-American study of kidney disease and hypertension that um, the variability is not actually benign. That, um, and it probably reflects a lot of things. Um, 
you know, endothelial dysfunction, baroreceptor dysfunction. So the more variability, you know, the worse the outcome. So there's probably something in it, you know, and then a lot of people are starting to get really interested in, you know, what that is. Thanks for the great talk, by the way. Um, with regarding to the aging population, mm -hmm. uh, people who are 75 and plus, is there a particular drug to avoid and is there a drug as a choice? I mean, you gave the first choice in general, but for the elderly population, is a one to I don't know, avoid I'm going to ask, ask Anal. Help me out here. What do you like to use over 75? Yeah, in your practice. And, and, and I think and adding on a CCB or, you know, probably usually have to use two drugs, so adding on a CCB or, you know, or, or um, I mean, look, you know. Any particular one to avoid? I'm sorry? Any one to avoid? Uh, yeah, the lots that have carcinogens in them now. <laughs> but that was only with ARBs. <laughs> I mean, that, but, 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 but actually, it reads an important point, is that why we have to be, you know, really um, scientifically based in what we prescribe for people. I mean, because, you know, there are people who go, I'm not going to take any drug because I'm not putting anything in my body that's, you know, not natural, and I, and I laugh at them, right? Until, you know, the uh, came out with Losartan had carcinogens in it, and I'm checking the lots of the drugs that I've been taking on, of Losartan, and I'm looking, have I been one of those lots? And I, have, and I call up the CVS people, and I'm friends with the pharmacists there on Westheimer and, and you know, 610. I said, well, you look at my records to see if you guys, if I've been taking, you know, a, a lot that had a carcinogen in it. Well, I hadn't been, which I'm glad about. But, you know, but, but other people were, right? So that's why I think we really have to be, you know, uh, precise and, and really evidence-based in what we, you know, give people. Like, you know, like what you found out with, um, you know, with your studies with uh, PPIs. Okay, one final question. We were under the, I am under the impression that whenever a patient has a CKD or starts to have a shift in his creatinine, we avoid ACE inhibitors. Now from the AASK study, it seems that it's okay to use... Yeah, 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 no, sure. I mean, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, so, because what you're doing, what you want to prevent, so, you know, you want to prevent hyperfiltration in the glomerulus. And so what you want to do is that you, you um, want to um, open up the efferent arterial. But what that does is that leads to an automatic drop, a physiological drop in GFR. So you're going to get a little bump in creatinine or, you know, because the GFR is going to go down. But over the long term, you're, hyper, you're not hyperfiltering. So, uh, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, you, and not only that, but uh, if in the absence of diabetes, the, the um, you know, we, and we publish this, is that the incidence of hyperkalemia is like 0.01%. So if you don't have diabetes and you have chronic kidney disease and you're on an ACE inhibitor, you're not even going to get hyperkalemic. So yeah, I mean, so it's, not, but ASK isn't the only study that showed this. I mean, so then there were other studies done in whites too, showing that, you know, that you want to, look, if, if the creatinine is like nine, I mean, I would, you know, wouldn't do it. But I mean, you know, creatinine is between three, four, yeah. I mean, carefully monitor them, you know, but, um, you know, in the long run, prevent less, you know, you'll, you'll blunt the progression of disease. And, you know, because you can decrease proteinuria, you know, and protein, you're, you know, and that's a big driver of, of worse outcome. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much. Great. Thanks. All right. Thanks a lot. That was great.